You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 120, COVID-19 dental business update for the week of April 21st. Justin and Chris are back with us again to give us an update this week on what to be thinking about in your business. How do the plans for states reopening change our thoughts on unemployment and loans? And what is the status of idle and PPP loan funding now that a new funding agreement has been reached in Congress? We're going to keep you up to date just like we've always been this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. This is Justin Goodbrand, and here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbrand here with Financially Simple. Now that we know we need a championship team, how do we build one? Well, first start by examining the personality profiles of your current team members. This will help you confirm if the right people are in the right seats. Once we know the personality profiles of the team, then we want to train them to become best in class in their specific role. You want them to understand their position so well that they're able to teach others. For example, your salesperson should be so valuable they could go to a national convention and teach others how to drastically improve their skills, their production, and even customer communication. To accomplish this feat, you will need a written professional development plan for each of your team members. Look folks, do all you can to help your team members succeed in the path in which they're walking and they will improve the value of your company. We have more tips on the blog post, 12 ideas for investing in employees that grow your team's values on financiallysimple.com. If you have questions about how to increase the value of your company or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other business related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. And welcome to this special live streaming episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm so pumped up after that music, Wes. I mean, yes! I'm, yeah, yes! I'm like, man, I mean, John, I'm getting ready. Right now, mm. I'm, I'm getting ready, okay, mm-hmm. for this afternoon's podcast, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to go ahead and plug that before we get to Justin and Chris, because we've got some amazing information coming your way. But I just acquired an N95 out of my sanding box. Yes. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to podcast during the Mary Gavoni interview (laughs) with my N95 on. Can I make it through the podcast? Stay tuned. That's coming up. I went through my garage the same way, man. I found a box of two. All right, it was in a plastic container from yeah. like painting, and and it had like a couple dead bugs on the outside of the plastic. But I mean, it's kind of like finding in ninety fives in your garage right now. It's like it's like when you're playing like a real intense video game and you find a secret passage and you find like the treasure chest that gives you like you know the, at the you know, end of Super Mario or Brothers or actually. Yes. You know where, whenever you found out like the secret like jump and you could like go yeah. into the green thing, right? The yes. little, little the, the warp zone. It's called the a warp, warp zone. zone. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Let me just tell yeah. you right now, this is it, right? So I'm, I'm excited about today's episode because one, we want to give you a financial update um, mm-hmm. on what is going on, right? Have you received your PPP yet, right? Have you, mm-hmm. have you, are we starting to see checks drop, you know, from idle, right? So why not just bring on the experts because we are not, right? We cut teeth for a living and we try to understand some of these things and surround <laughs> ourselves pe- with people that really know more, right? Before the, the pre-production meeting was interesting, John, because both of us are sitting here scratching our heads like, okay, stop for just a minute, back up. So we need to bring Justin and Chris on. Justin from financiallysimple.com and Chris from Mayhan and Associates. 
Welcome back to the show, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. What's up, hey guys? How are you? Doing pretty well. Uh, I mean, I, you guys, do you guys get keyed up by the music too, like us? <laughs> Dude, I was hand, head banging you over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you need in the morning to get rolling, especially for some of us who are not as you know, financially literate, you need like a little pump up music before you get into the high <laughs> weed with what we're going to talk about today. But, but it, that's really why we, one of the reasons we have you guys on is because you're able to take some of these real complicated topics and break them down into kind of action plan of what, what should we be doing? What should we be thinking about? So I, I want to dive right into that because, you know, kind of where we are now for most of us, we've sort of got two groups that, that we are hearing the most from. One is people that I think most all practices, you know, applied for the idle loan. Some have gotten that money, some haven't. So I want an update from you guys on that. But we've kind of had two groups of people, some that have applied for the PPP loan and gotten the money, some that have not gotten the money or haven't applied yet. So I really want to talk through today, you know, what's happening with those two programs, the idle loan program, the PPP, and we have some new information coming out just today, really, about what Congress is thinking about funding um, and kind of just where do we need to go? And then right before the show, we got into a little bit of interesting discussion too about some of the uh, ramifications long term with this. But I really I think there's a there's a new player that's come up in the last, uh, especially couple of weeks that I think you guys were aware of. We were not a lot of dentists were not, which is the employee retention credit and how that kind of factors in. So let's maybe start with uh, talking about uh, Chris. You mentioned to me just before we got on the show that. You just saw idle loans come through, uh, and so I thought you know maybe that money was was used up, but it sounds like people are still getting that money dropping into their uh, their accounts. What's the status with that first, and then we'll talk a little bit about the PPP and kind of where we need to go there. Sure, I believe it was last week on the podcast where we saw the very first idle distribution come through, and that person had made their idle application on March 29th, and subsequently a bunch of uh, clients and friends. Uh, of ours made, did their applications on March 30th. And last night, 420, um, it looks like it started dropping money into multiple uh, practices, bank accounts uh, for the thousand dollars per employee. So some got 2000, some got 6,000, some got the cap of 10,000. And that's the grant. That's the free money that comes with idle. But pretty much no strings attached, as I understand it, is, but you can't use it for PPP costs. So it looks like idols, uh, monies are starting to drop. So if you've made your application, keep your eyes open for your bank accounts because they just drop it right in there. Um, and and they're also refunding, recapitalizing it with the proposed uh, uh, stimulus coming through Congress that may be voted on today or tomorrow. Okay. So that's good news to know that, that the money mm-hmm. may be exhausted, quote unquote, from that first funding round, but it's still coming. It's still co- going into accounts which is good. And we've got some more funding coming out from, from that. And uh, Justin, let's go to you. Talk about kind of where we are right now with uh, funding for these programs and for this, especially the PPP. And then, you know, we'll, we'll spend probably the majority of the time talking about where these two groups of people should be going now that have gotten their money or haven't and, and kind of go through that. But where are we right now with the funding of these programs? Yeah, so funding uh, ran out last uh, Thursday at about 9.15 in the morning time. What that means is there is no more federal dollars inside the SBA coffers at that particular point. Now, several people had loans approved by their banks and by the SBA. And if you'll remember from our conversation last week, those individuals who had approval from the SBA, the banks had 10 days to basically fund that account. Um, so what's happened at the at the federal level is Congress has been dealing with trying to figure out how to put more dollars into this account. And as of in the last 24 hours, I actually pulled this out that we've had the Treasury Secretary Schumer, Vice President, the President McConnell and Pelosi all say that they're very close. And even as a fact, this morning, Treasury Secretary basically said, look, we should we should have approval today. Nancy Pelosi came out and wrote, and I quote, we believe um, I believe we've come to terms on the principles of the legislation, which is a good thing, but it's always the fine print, she went on to say. And so now we're down to the fine print, fine print, but I fear 
feel very optimistic and hopeful that we'll come out with a conclusion. She was said that in today's context, that they're hoping they can vote on this today. And if this passes, what they're proposing is in another four, uh, $470 billion, $470 billion, which will put this total stimulus just almost at $3 trillion. That's, it's, it's magnificent. I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's enormous <laughs> when you think about it in the sense of dollars. But here's the way they're breaking down this new 470. Roughly $370 billion will be directed to the small businesses. Uh, $75 billion will go to hospitals. And $25 billion will be set aside for testing. Now, inside that for $370 billion, they're going to further break that down to $310 billion is to go to the PPP program, which we talked about. Roughly because of um, some pre-conversations that we had earlier that we'll get into about the way some of the banks have positioned their larger clients first, this particular bill is going to break it down even further to show that roughly $60 billion will be, re- will be reserved for smaller financial institutions, um, and roughly about $60 billion will go into the 7B or the idle loan the, um, that Chris was just alluding to. So it looks like by all notions, even my contacts on the Hill this morning are telling me, Justin, it looks like we're going to get this thing done today. And as the Treasury Secretary said this morning um, on the news that was posted on Wall Street, Journal that if this is signed today, then we could be processing tomorrow loans for the additional PPP funding. Hmm. So it's it's here, and um, so that brings us to the question everybody's asking. Literally, the the million dollar question uh, is: What do you do if let's let's talk about probably the easiest way to start is if you haven't applied yet. Because we can talk about what do you do if you've already applied and gotten your PPP funds maybe toward the end, because I think that'll kind of follow along with people that haven't applied. But what do you do if you haven't applied for PPP or if you've been waiting or you just didn't get the money the first go around? If you're in that boat, I know there's lots of states that are talking about reopening. So we're getting at least closer to reopening, although we still don't know for sure. Um, and, And Chris, I want you to talk about this with contrast to the other option, and and because uh, there's another option out there with this employee retention credit, so Chris, why don't you talk a little bit about what is the employee retention credit and and how does that play into this PPP decision for people that haven't applied yet, and what does this all mean? Well, yeah, there's there a lot of different options and stimulus that have come in to help small business, um, and the employee retention credit didn't get a lot of attention at first because. You know, of course, it's not as sexy as, you know, 100 percent forgivable loan that's not taxable, which is, you know, the vehicle that the PPP uh, comes through. But the PPP has its criteria where the date it's funded, you're on your eight week clock as it's currently written on the eight week clock to spend 75 percent of the total funds on payroll. And you have to meet and match your historical prior payroll per pay period or for the eight week period. And <clears throat> you have to keep the same full-time equivalent. So that's where it comes with some catches. So uh, there's not really a one size fits all answer here. And, you know, I think that we all try to be very careful in saying, this is what you need to do. Um, I will say what you need to do for all practitioners out there is look at your individual circumstances, look at your practice, when your practice is going to open and be full steam are all the employees going to be available to come back now that school's closed and they're doing my daughter yesterday just got her um, from Davidson County, Nashville online portal, and she's doing virtual classes starting next Monday from home. So that's going to, that's going to shake some things up. So, you know, can all your staff come back? Those are things you have to ask yourself on the PPP side and to get over to the ERC or the employee retention credit. That is what we know. We know how tax credits work. And how it's called for is if your office was shut down due to COVID or quarter over quarter, you had a 50 percent reduction in your revenues from the prior year, which every office basically qualifies for quarter two, 2020. Then you have up to ten thousand dollars per employee or 50 percent of their wages for that quarter that you get for a refundable tax credit. So if you've got the money to float through right now and based on other circumstances that, you know, again, it's really specific to each practice and how their employee costs look, when they're going to open, how many employees are going to be there. Do they have the proper PPE 
not to be you know confused with the PPP, um, then the employee retention credit may be a very viable model for you because if you look at the basically benefit on an eight employee practice, let's say you got eight employees, average forty two thousand five hundred a year. The benefit to the profit margins of the practice come into about forty thousand dollars on the employee retention credit. You get ten thousand per employee. You get half of their wages. That's five thousand for the quarter that you get in a refundable tax credit. So you get to save immediately on cash flow and what you would have paid in payroll taxes. And they stroke you a check back from the United States Treasury without bank underwriters, without banks giving. Because here's the other catch: the banks on the other side of this have the forgiveness provision of PPP. So you got your money now. What? You better spend it right and you better have a meticulous paper trail because the banks are not going to let this just be easy for give money because then the SBA is going to be on their backs. Right. That's something that we're really not talking about is uh, this whole idea of the meticulous paper trail. And I think it'd be good at some point in time to talk about once the PPP (laughs) is funded into your bank account. How do we bookkeep that? Right. Because Mm -hmm. I think people are going to probably misuse this money. And uh, we got to be very, very careful about that. And I think, you know, we need to probably have you guys back on to talk a little bit about that. Okay. So you're, but yeah, you're I'd saying, like to, like to, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to make one point because think about it. The average in dental practices, eight to 12 employees are getting about a hundred grand potentially on, on their uh, PPP loans. Let's say heaven forbid that we're not fully operational until May 15th. And let's say heaven forbid out of those eight employees Two of them can't make it back and you really have six full time equivalents and you don't just go out and rehire for free loan forgiveness. You you hire based on need. and Maybe you don't need eight employees to start off. So let's say six of the eight employees make it back and we don't get up and open our doors really until May 15th. You're looking at a potential reduction of your loan forgiveness by half. So if you take that hundred thousand dollar note and have that potential forgiveness eliminated from half, you've got a fifty thousand dollar note. Everybody says, but Chris, it's on 1% on a 24-month note. I'm like, no, it's on 1% on an 18-month note because the first six months aren't forgiven. And if you run the AM schedule on that 50 grand, that's three grand a month debt service that you just swallowed, not utilizing PPP the correct way. Hmm. So you're saying that with this employee retention credit, that if, again, the, the advantage of that <clears throat> is it's a known thing. Uh, we could say, hey, if we have X number of employees, we know what their pay is during this time. If we can show that we've had enough reduction in our uh, revenue or affected by COVID, then that's essentially, you can do that calculation right now Mm -hmm. and know basically what you're going to get from it. And the downside of the PPP, if I'm understanding this right, is that there's a lot of things you don't know. You still don't know 100% your opening date. You still don't know 100% if every employee can come back. Um, And there's a huge decrease in the forgiveness if even just a couple of employees can't come back. Now, can you, uh, just to understand this, there are some things we can do, though, to increase the amount potentially of forgiveness by in other ways, right? Even if you don't have uh, I mean, there are things you can do as a as a practitioner, as a business person. For instance, if you're able now, again, this all assumes we are able to, but you can you can uh, work more hours to increase your payroll to get more forgiveness. So if you have the capacity and you have the patience, um, you can work more hours. You can also uh, discuss things like retirement contributions. Are the things we can do to front load those expenses into this time? I mean, so there are there some things we can do on the PPP side that we know we can do at this point, or is it still kind of we're asking a lot of questions we don't know the answer to? Um, if I may, I think on that one, there's still a lot of clarification that's got to be made, John. Um, if you read the rules, read the law, and even the guidance you have provided by the SBA, there's a particular quote inside there that says cost incurred, in quotes, cost incurred and payments made. So you're going to have to be careful on how you, quote, front load things, and you're going to have to be careful on how you front bonus. I actually heard one practi- uh, one advisor say, hey, we're just going to go ahead and give our employees a bonus and not pay them for the next eight weeks. 
from weeks number nine through 16. That doesn't fall in line with cost incurred and payments made. So at this point, particular point, what we do know is the forgiveness portion has to go 75% to payroll. Payroll is the same calculation that we use to apply for those dollars, right? So for those individuals who have yet to apply, um, what I want to tell you to go ahead and do is give your banker like yesterday, um, go ahead and fill the paperwork out, give them the information they're going to ask for. And every bank's a little, still a little different in that. But you're ultimately going to calculate your, your payroll as it relates to, I'm reading the rules right now, salary, wage, uh, commissions, or similar compensations. They were talking about a regular business with employees, not sole proprietor. That's a whole different animal to unwind there. Um, payments and cash tips, payments for vacation, parental, family, medical, and sick leave, uh, allowances for dismissal of separations, any retirement benefits, any provisions for group health care, including insurance premiums and payment of state and local assessed taxes. So that's your payroll number is a lot of things put together in there where it's going to get kind of tricky and where the SBA and has to give us some guidance on this is what do they mean by that cost incurred and payments made? What I have mm -hmm. a feeling they're going to be dealing with is annualizing out how exactly you should um, if you were to annualize out the benefits. So for example, let's say your health insurance. I don't think, I'm going to say today on, on live on the air, I don't think they're going to allow you to go and prepay the rest of the year's health insurance premiums. I just mm -hmm. don't think that's going to happen because it wasn't incurred. I don't think they're going to allow you to go and prepay a ton of retirement benefits. Um, now, there are certain time periods where retirement benefits are lumped in, and there's some little bit of gray area there that I really believe the SBA is going to give us some guidance on. So I I'd be careful with some of the language that's being <laughs> floated around right now by several different advisors, even some big advisors, because the rules clearly say cost incurred and not or cost incurred and payments made. So I hope that answers mm -hmm. that particular question. Yeah. And that, I mean, that totally is mm. not what some advisors uh, have been talking about. They've been no. saying, oh, well, we can front load expenses. And by front loading expenses, we can, you know, say you, I mean, we got a question come through the feed just a second ago along the same line. David asks, if I rehire zero employees between now and June 30th, can I still use 25% of my PPP funds for non-payroll costs and have that 25% forgiven? My understanding, and please please weigh in on this, guys, it doesn't work that way. You've got to have 25% as you still have to pay payroll costs, right? It has to be in a ratio. You can't just use this for mortgage interest payments, utilities. If you don't have any employees hired back, you're not getting any forgiveness. Is that is that right? That's 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 correct. Um, it's uh, the forgiveness is 100 percent based on two things. The amount. Of, well, three things. Having your employees hired back by June 30th, as it's written now, and how much you paid compared to last year in payroll to your employees and the full time equivalent count. So those three mm -hmm. items have to, you know, have to be satisfied for the forgiveness to come in. And back to, to echo what Justin said. Yeah, I would be very leery. I mean, just seeing how bank underwriters have gotten so much more diligent on this supposedly easily underwritten loan. Um, they're really coming through and wanting to get copies on the front end of health insurance policies. And if it's not available to the entire team as a group medical plan, it gets kicked out. Um, they're wanting to start wanting to see pension allocations, contribution allocations. Um, so again, I, 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 I echo Justin caution plan how you spend the money. And yeah, if it's not, if you don't hit the, the criteria on employees retention and employees compensation and full-time equivalent employees, this kind of thing can get real, you get upside down real quick if you don't do it the right way. So where it could make sense then, it sounds like, is if, if, if you open, let's just, again, let's talk best case scenario, right? Just for a second, because a lot of this has been kind of some worst case scenario stuff, which we should talk about. But if states reopen, if you're in a state that reopens May 4th or maybe even May 15th and then that and you can go back to work and we're going to be talking to a couple different people about PPE. But let's assume that we can operate, we can practice, <clears throat> patients are coming in um, where it could work out well is if you're able to put your staff back to work, your team back to work and you're able to. Um, have the full-time equivalent number back up to where it needs to be because 
it needs to be back up by the June 30th date, right? Not on necessarily day one, but by the end. Is that right? So is that the way that it could work out well for you if you were in that scenario? Yeah, if, if you were going to paint the dream scenario, and we've talked about this offline a lot, guys, but just to kind of repeat is today's the 21st, April the 21st. I'm looking at a calendar in front of me, and let's make the assumption that the PPP is funded tomorrow just as a, as a kicks and giggles, and that would be the 22nd. And let's make another assumption that your bank has already approved your loan, as Chris was just talking about. They did their pre-underwriting, and tomorrow, April the 22nd, Wednesday, you mm -hmm. actually get SBA approval. OK, so idealistically, it could work in a sweet spot if those two things were to align to where you get approval tomorrow and then you wait 10 days, which if my math serves me right, would be Sunday the I'm sorry, do this in my head Sunday the 4th, I think it is, or Saturday the 4th, which means that we could theoretically be back. Um, I'm sorry, Monday the 4th, May the 4th, May the 4th be with you, by the way, um, <laughs> where we now have our team back in place. There are some states already <laughs> that. It, that dentist offices are being released to open up as soon as next week. So it could be in a position where now you're, you get the, you get the funding on, you know, the second, the first, the fourth, and now you start the machine back up and you're maximizing at that point, the rehiring of your team all the way up until June the 30th. Um, I mm -hmm. think that's the best possible scenario. If you say, well, Justin, I, I'm, I'm going to wait until a week and a half from now before I apply, I think that would be misguided. I really believe the funds are going to fly off the shelf. In fact, the news media, Wall Street Journal, just before I jumped on here, said they don't predict these monies are going to be available for much more than about two to three days. So I think mm -hmm. idealistically, for those who haven't applied, go ahead and give your bank yesterday and make sure they get submitted by early tomorrow. If you have already applied, then have your the bank should be in processing those loans tomorrow. And then if you're approved tomorrow, if assuming again, if we get the funding as we've talked about earlier in the conversation, um, then what you want to do is if you get the funding and you want the funding, then you want to delay the actual um if you sorry, if you get the approval, you want to delay the funding for as long as possible. Wait that 10 days. That gives you more runway to utilize these funds for maximum forgiveness, as Chris was alluding to a few minutes ago. I think you'd be misguided right now and probably a very poor decision um, at this point if you went out and got funding the minute you got um, approval from the SBA. I think we, we are so close to be able to utilize this loan properly um, that it makes sense to delay the actual funding as long as possible. But as Chris said earlier, and back to you on this, Chris, mm -hmm. if, right, this is, this is assuming we go back to work and we can work and we have the PPE necessary to go back to work. So kind of heading back toward the either whatever you want to call it, worst case scenario or the, you know, the, the PPE question or the busyness question, or maybe you're in a state that's already said we're not going back till June 15th. That's what I'm if saying, John. I mean, situation. like, what if you're in like Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So should you then be looking at this employee retention credit more? I guess the question a lot of people are going to be asking is where, obviously we know that the, the, the end response here is talk to your advisor, right? We're not going to say specifically who needs to do what, but Chris, speak to that a little bit as to, you know, what would be some of the things that would push you more in general toward thinking about the employee retention credit versus the PPP, how much does this depend on your mm. opinion of how things are going to go? And how much does this depend on your opening date? You know, which are, what are some of the things that, that you would you know, tell somebody to start thinking through? Well, the way I'm calculating it, you know, again, let's say funding comes in on Thursday, Friday, they open up the um, E-Tran lines and applications where they can start giving the E-Tran numbers and funds to businesses. Let's say that you can defer your receipt with your banker until potentially May 7th. I'm looking at pretty much a, a four week break even, you know, based on my internal calculations that if you get PPP money, again, using that same 100,000 model, um, basically it's a four week break even in terms of the benefit of the business, whether it's their employee retention credit and the PPP side. So I would okay. recommend if you think you're going to be open and full going, by June 1st, potentially June 8th, I think the PPP, based on just given norms without doing an in-depth, you know, per client or per practice analysis, it's kind of a good baseline to say the PPP will potentially outrun the ERC in terms of benefits. Okay. So 
Okay. Um, that's the first thing. And then, you know, if you've got people that have already applied or got their money already wired or coming quickly, I still recommend holding on to it until you get back up and going. And the amount that you don't utilize, you can turn around and pay that back to minimize any loan exposure that you may recognize due to it not being forgiven. So that's a great point because that's, that's moving into that other group of people that have already gotten the PPP money, which uh-huh. a lot of people have. Um, you're saying hold on to the money. Uh, is that as is that as a response to some of these advisors that may be saying go ahead and prepay expenses or try to find creative ways to use the money? Is that why you say that, or or is it just a matter of uh, not not wanting to get caught on the back end? Yeah, I think that it's a matter of potentially not getting caught on the back end, just due to the fact that again, the only con- the, the only known is the unknown, right? And that being said, we don't know, you know. If you bring back everybody and put your staff on payroll while they're sitting at the house, right, will that potentially affect them later down the road and getting unemployment benefits if they, for heaven forbid, need it, right? If you start putting on the payroll today to have it all forgiven, if we're not back in operational, are there going to be any, are there going to be any look back provisions for not maintaining that number of payroll for a certain amount of time after the fact, right? So those are the reasons why I would hold it. And then, and then you bring the point. And Justin and I have been collaborating on this since really day one. Are there are strategic ways that people that get the PPP loan can maximize the utilization for the benefits of their staff and also to support and help the practice and put it in a good position? But it's really going to be a case by case model. There's not going to be a cookie cutter sheet that we can just send a newspaper or an article out or fill in the calculator. That'll be, you know, getting with your financial advisors, your accountants, your practice advisors to sit there and say, okay, I've got the money. Now let's get a plan on how we cleanly allocate these funds. So when the eight weeks is up, I can be the first in line back to the bank before the underwriter's eyes are bloodshot and and they're mad at the world anyway for for having to do this. And they're just stamping it. No, they'll look at you say, thank God this person was clean. They use it the right way. Stamp it. Yes. And you maximize your benefit. Man, so so let's let's talk about another another side to this because what I'm getting from what you're saying on people have already gotten the PPP money, they may not get a lot of benefit out of it. I mean, in the end, you know, it's 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 because our opening dates are are at the best, probably you know a couple weeks away. If you've already gotten the money, just kind of realize you might not get a lot of benefit about it, so just use it cleanly. What about the next round of funding? So let's say you said two to three days. What about people that say, should I wait and not apply at all because I am hoping that there'll be another round of funding that will get me closer to my opening date if I'm in a state that is opening later? Um, do you think that there's going to be more funding? Obviously, this is real crystal ball stuff, but what what do you guys kind of project is going to happen? There's been a lot of bad press coming out about uh, who's been actually getting this money in the last week or so. Justin, speak to that a little bit. Yes. So you're exactly right. This is crystal ball information here. Um, I wish I had a good crystal ball in the future, but here's what I can say. I've watched politics for almost 35, 40 years now of my life. And those of us who understand how the slow wheels of Washington move, that whenever we can get a consensus, especially in the venomous type of a situation we're dealing with and in an election year, think about those two things. Uh, I have a feeling I don't have anything to validate this with, and I very well could be wrong. I have a feeling this will be the last sort of funding that we see. I really do. You look at just the 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 press involved on the funding, not to mention we're at $3 trillion almost in funding at this point. We have lawsuits now being waged against some of the top banks out there, and candidly, in my opinion, rightfully so at certain points, um, based on some of the information that even our clients have experienced from some of these bigger institutions. Um, So I think with the negative press, I think you now have, even I saw a burger station, I think the name of the uh, burger chain off the top of my head, that was giving the money back because of some of the negative negative press. Um, So I I have a feeling that this is the last time that we're going to see this particular position funded. I could be wrong. That being said, 
it's reported everywhere. Just Google this thing right now that you've had banks now for the last four business days who have been approving loan applications at their level. As soon as ETRAN comes online and the pot, so to speak, is refilled, these bankers are going to be trying to submit their applications as fast as possible. And we saw $260 billion of the original PPP money moved in roughly about three days, four days, once the system started working. Now they know how the system System works. And now you have things like PayPal and Quicken Loans and Square who are also involved in this kitty pile. So I have a feeling the dollars on this particular funding at the 300 a billion dollars that's allocated to the PPP will be removed in roughly about two to three days. The only saving grace would be is this, is that according to the, some of the reports I read just as early as like 3 a.m. this morning, um, yeah, I was awake, I had no life, <clears throat> but as some of the things I was reading this morning is a lot of the big firms were funded right off the bat. So this may be now where mom and pop mainstream America, like Chris was talking about earlier, is going to get funding. But still, I still don't think there's enough money here to hit the position. I think there's like 20% of the businesses have yet to be funded. Um, plus the way they're breaking it out for the idle loans, et cetera. I think it's going to go quick, guys. I really do. Well, I appreciate everybody listening today. I've got one one other question here before we close up. Um, and I'm smiling because I'm excited about this question. This is a great question. I'm smiling because I've been waiting for this one, you know, just <laughs> just waiting for this. One of our uh, listeners, uh, Jonathan, asks, Dave Ramsey says to stay away from the PPP. What are your thoughts on that? Justin and Chris, I'm going to split screen you right now. <laughs> Respectfully, don't you love when you start off with responses that way? No, again, I get I get concerns for, you know, and again, respectfully, you can't put a blanket statement on that, Um I mean, you know, I respect Dave Ramsey and a lot of things he said and a lot of the people that he's helped throughout his uh, his ministry. Um, but that being said, yeah, I don't think it's one size fits all. I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, but again, you just got to play it smart, play it right. And again, if you have questions about it, then you may be better off holding off. You know, and then back to, you know, Justin's state, statement, this round of funding, the banks are saying has a $50 billion a day burn rate. So you see how many days it's going to take it all out, you know, right out of the gate. And nobody, you know, and that's the magical question. The real magic question, John, is if they do another round of funding in mid-May, late June, those are the businesses that are going to really get the biggest benefit out of this. They're going to get a huge benefit because it'll be closer aligned with their true operational, you know, restart date. Um, and that that's that's the crystal ball. But then back to back to that statement, I can't. I think it's a case by case basis that you need to talk to your advisors to see what the best thing for you. What do you think, Justin? (laughs) Um, I love it when talk show personalities who get to put entertainment entertainer on their tax returns often give advice in the financial matter with no liability. Um, So I'm going to say that right off the bat. I respect a lot of what Dave Ramsey. I read several of his books every year and have for over 30 years. Um, He is a primary. (laughs) Wes is laughing. I just am being honest, guys. uh, Dave Ramsey is a primary uh, driver. Let me tell you this to why I'm successful today. Because of Dave Ramsey's philosophy, guys, I have no debt except for a small house mortgage. So I give him all the credit. The problem with it is, is he's not a fiduciary and he's not the person who is going to be sued for bad advice. Okay. And mm-hmm. it's easy to listen to talking heads. Dave's one of the many out there that give advice on these things. The problem is, is that I don't fall in to Dave Ramsey's typical clientele, his typical listenership. Neither do the majority of the clients that we have the honor and privilege to serve. They're not broke. They're not having to go to an envelope system to figure out how to feed their family. That's not who we're working with, which is the majority of who he serves and who he speaks to. So I I love a lot of what he says. I think this is very interesting advice. And I would tend to say a case by case needs to make the decision up. Yeah, I mean, if you can uh, say you're almost getting into this <clears throat> all debt is bad situation and, yeah. you know, go to Wall Street, let's have that discussion, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it seems they don't agree. Any business whatsoever over a certain market capitalization, uh, there's good debt and there's bad debt. And I think it's, it's, a, it's you guys are both very gracious in your responses, but I, I think that's a, so I, good. I'm just going to say that's, that's irresponsible. That's actually kind of really sad to see that because I'm thinking, man, you could really lose out. Your competitors are sure going to take advantage of uh, that money. So, gosh, you know, 
you, well, you don't always have to say something, guy. You know, you could you don't, just you don't always have to say something, right? I know that Chris and Justin take you know the the high road on this, and I appreciate that because they are fiduciary. Uh, I know Justin is Chris. You know, as an advisor, uh, he's always done the best for what you know in 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 the hands of clients. But um, you know, it's a shame. I'll just come out and say it. You know, it, I mean, I can't imagine not taking this. You know, John, I mean, if you said I'm not taking it, right? Well, I hope you have, you right. know, a hundred grand just laying around and yeah, ready American, to go. You know, I mean, American Airlines shouldn't have taken a bell out, right? I mean, what? That's right. Of course they Let's should. Just let it all go down. <clears throat> you know? Let's just let it I mean, all go that, down and, and burn down. the world works. Yeah, I agree with what Justin's saying. Like if you're, if you have zero dollars and you have $10,000 of debt on credit cards, you, you're perfect fit. For what we need to be dealing with here with Dave Ramsey, yeah. that's who he that's who he does, and he does amazing things for those people, amazing things. But when you're talking about business, it's just a different clientele that you know. Yeah. You're, it's just a different situation. There's good and bad debt. So, I mean, this this has been. I, I think if if you're listening to this and you, I mean, I, I feel like this hits people exactly where they need to be yeah. hit right now with the knowledge that they need. And it is interesting. Just as we close. There's a lot of bad advice out there right now. It seems like you would think that that'd be kind of cleaning up, but it's actually not cleaning up. It's actually getting maybe a little bit more spotty right now because people yeah. are getting a little bit more desperate uh, to kind of, uh, you guys have been, to, to give you guys credit because you won't say it yourselves, you guys have been very consistent in your recommendations from the time we, we first started talking. And it just turns, just so happens that all the things that you guys have kind of been recommending have have happened the way that you kind of thought they would happen. So nice work. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. Yeah, well, thank so you guys as far for giving as, us the forum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. been it's been great to have you know people uh, that can come in and get this high quality information that's reasonable. And you know, I, I think that we we're going to be keeping up over the coming weeks because um, Wes kind of brought this up earlier. We need, we're going to have more rolling out on the other end of this, which is the forgiveness side. How mm -hmm. do you maximize that? How do we work within the guidelines? And there's going to be, I'm sure, so much more guidance coming out in the next few weeks on what does that actually look like. So for those of you who are getting this money now and mm -hmm. kind of wondering how exactly to handle it, uh, we'll be talking more about that in the upcoming episodes. I think next week when we talk, it's going to be interesting to see what actually happened with this round of funding. Um, and what kind of the political side of it's looking like for, uh, for next time. So, um, I I'll go ahead and just turn it over to you, Wes, to kind of close this yeah. out for today. So I know that some of you may have not got your questions answered. Well, that's okay because, uh, we'll, we'll pass those along to, uh, to Justin and Chris as we see them come in. Uh, we're going to co-release this episode as a audio and video update uh, that'll be released on all of the podcast outlets, uh, Apple uh, Podcasts, Spotify, all those things. So I really appreciate you guys joining in and listening. Uh, people find out about the dental guys um, in one way. We don't pay for advertising in any way. Uh, we don't do Facebook boosting. We find uh, people find us because of you. And that's why we appreciate listeners just like you sharing liking, subscribing, hit the notification bell. That way, you know, if you're on YouTube or on Facebook, that you know that we've went live and we're doing a lot more live streaming because a lot of this is so fluid. It needs to be uh, brought to you in a manner like this. So we'll continue to do financial updates as long as we see fit until, uh, until Justin and Chris get tired of talking shop, but that's what they do, and and we like to top shop uh, clinically, and that's why this afternoon uh, we're going to have here very shortly. Stay tuned, Mary Gavoni, which is an uh, expert in the amount of matters of uh, OSHA, and she's a she helps to bring offices up to the right standards. We're going to talk about PPE. Um, can you practice with a level three mask and feel safe about it? Can you? Is there any liability? Uh, to practicing with level three if you don't have N95s. We're going to ask some of those tough questions to Mary coming up very soon. So stay tuned. Uh, keep your fingers on play. And uh, we're going to bring all this episode uh, stuff right to you. And we're excited to do that. So for Chris, Justin, John, I'm Wes. And we are the Dental Guys.